My name is Bert Coliani, and I'm the chair and proud to be the chair of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library and its board of overseers. As you know, we affectionately call it Himmel. Sometimes you wonder if we're doing a disservice because we're proud to be uh, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, proud to be standing here in the Hill Library, and proud to have continued roots and service with our board members, including Barbara Slade from the family. It's really a long and proud tradition. Last year we celebrated 50 years, so I guess we're coming up on 51 years as an organization, and uh, things keep getting better. I want to extend a warm welcome to St. John's University President, Dr. Michael Hemeseth. Dr. Michael, I can't see you, the lights are bright. I know we chatted earlier, but thank you for driving down. We're grateful for all the support we received from you and from the St. John's. Himmel's proud to be part of St. John's University, a Benedictine learning community. I also want to recognize a longtime patron and a good friend of Himmel and a friend of Susie and mine, uh, Mr. Joseph S. Mikolif. Joe, I talked with earlier, I can't see you either, but Joe, raise your hand somewhere. There's, there's Joe, appreciate that. Mr. Mikolif is founder of Himmel's Malta Study Center. Those of us who have traveled to Malta in 2013 have warm memories of the hospitality extended to our group. We're honored to have you with us tonight also. Thank you, both of you. I want to welcome all of you, our Himmel friends and guests. Those of you who are already fans of Himmel and all, all those that are, you will soon become fans as you learn more about our organization. Uh, tonight is a nice time to celebrate the work done, honor uh, what's ahead of us, and also learn more from our guest speaker, which I'll introduce in a moment. One only needs to read the headlines to know the tra that tragically the world's cultural heritage is at risk of disappearing. Some of the manuscript uh, collections that Himmel has, dig uh, has digitized have already disappeared. As ISIS and other religious extremists continue to target human culture, the patrimony of ancient faith communities is being obliter obliterated, if I could say that name, obliterated. As they continue their assault on our cultural heritage and destroy libraries, museums, and shrines of every faith, they rob of humanity our history. Himmel's work to digitally preserve manuscripts collections ensures that the languages in the library and litur liturgical traditions and histories of these communities alive are accessible forever. Now I'll go off script here real quickly, but tonight in chatting, I was visiting with Phil um, uh, Berry, and he asked me what is it about Himmel that so um, uh, motivates me, and I said it's just that very point, and I'm sure you all feel it when you pick up the newspapers. Something that used to feel sort of academic and esoteric about Himmel maybe 10 or 15 years ago feels so real to me and I think to everybody in this room, and that's just that culture and the patr patrimony and the ability to transmit culture through art, through uh, history, through architecture, through Basically, the peoples of various faiths and religions and traditions is at risk, and we feel it every day and feel it deeply. Tonight is a celebratory time, but it's also a time to really reflect on what more not only Himmel can do, but we can do as people. Most of you know that Himmel's executive director, Father Columbus Stewart, is taking a research leave during this academic year and is now in residence at the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. He will be finishing his book, Between Earth and Heaven, Interpreting the First Thousand Years of Christian Monasticism. While there, he will still be managing Himmel's fieldwork uh, field sites via Skype and email. Since Father Columba can't be with us tonight, he's recorded a greeting for us that highlights our current work and talks about some exciting work in new locations. So please listen to Father Columba and his words. Good evening, everyone. Normally, I thank you in person, but this time I'm going to do it in this manner. The Millennium Club is an opportunity when we gather our closest friends and thank them for their continuing support of Himmel. All of you know that the past year has shown the importance of our mission to be greater and more urgent than ever. And you're the people who make it happen. So I'm sorry I can't be with you. I'm sorry I can't hear Father Suarez's lecture. But when you do see me, 
in person next time. I'll have plenty more stories to tell. And as some of you may have learned at our recent board meeting and we'll be seeing in some of our publications and media, we have a very exciting year with new projects and new places. And this reminder that every little bit you can do to help us really goes a very long way. Thank you so much. So in 2015, as we celebrated our 50th anniversary, a lot of our attention was focused on ramping up our project with the Tempup 2 manuscripts in Mali. It was already a big project, now it's even bigger. 12 cameras that are operating there. We've never had a project on anything like that scale. And a lot of our energy at Himmel, of course, was devoted to the launch of vHimmel and continuing development of our online reading room. This year in 2016, we've made a lot of progress on all those fronts but we've had an unexpected flurry of new project opportunities, which are going to take us into the Balkans for the first time, working with Serbian manuscripts throughout the countries of the former Yugoslavia. New initiatives with Persian manuscripts, which potentially could have us involved in projects across Central Asia and as far as Afghanistan. Going back to the Ukraine for the first time since 2008, new major projects in Lebanon, and even the chance to go back into Syria and do some work there, which we never got to do the first time, working with some of our partners in Lebanon. And then working in Yemen for the first time, as we do manuscript preservation in the midst of an actual war. And of course, by the time you're seeing this, we will have finally launched the online reading room. Probably the greatest technological step that we've taken in terms of access to the manuscripts that we've microfilmed and digitized over these 50 years. So 2016 has already been an exciting year, and we're not done yet. Thank you, Father. I think everybody in this room knows Father Columba and knows the impact he's had on Himmel, but I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's really been an honor for me personally to befriend Father, to encourage and witness and hopefully support his work, and to... Uh, uh, travel and basically have our eyes and ears open to what's going on in this world. Tonight's speaker, Father Michael Suarez, brings energy and vitality to his work as an advocate for the book, as an object and historical record, and as the director of a school that educates others in this field. He helps draw those connections between why history, particularly history of the book, is, crucial, is a crucial component to how we encourage and exchange ideas, analyze the past and current events, and indeed how we engage with each other. Michael Suarez has been director of the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia uh, since 2000, September of 2019. He's a Jesuit priest who holds four master's degrees in English and theology and a doctor of philosophy in English from the University of Oxford. Before coming to the Rare Book School, he had a joint appointment at Fordham University as a fellow and a tutor in English at Campion Hall, oh, excuse me, and as a fellow and a tutor in English at Campion Hall at Oxford. In addition to his duties as director, he teaches at University of Virginia's uh, Department of English and has written ex extensively on 18th century English literature, bibliography, and book history. Now, all that being said, four master's degrees and a doctorate, which is a little intimidating to like somebody like myself. You know, I can hold up my CPA certificate to show you all, but, uh, <laughs> but let me say this in a much more human way. He's just a great amount of fun, a very, very personable guy. I think that if we didn't have to stand up and you know, have this sort of formal evening. He's the guy I want to go out to and have a beer with, and we could talk about everything under the sun, and I mean all of that sincerely. Uh, what a wonderful human being, and what a wonderful academic to talk to us about rare books and bibliography and book history and the importance of the written word. It's my pleasure to introduce a distinguished scholar and a true kindred spirit to our work at Himmel, Dr. Michael Suarez. I suppose in the interest of full disclosure, I could say that um, my mom helped him write that introduction. <laughs> That's, 
Rather than this evening present some complex research finding for you, um, I'd like to kind of do a thinking presentation. I'd like to think with you about the role of libraries in the digital age. And um, I'd like to look at it from a variety of perspectives so that we might have a deeper understanding of where we are and indeed of where we might go. Um, remember Cicero said if you have a garden and a library, you have all that you need. And this might prove the leitmotif for uh, our discussion this evening. So I, I, I need to begin with a kind of uh, confession. Uh, how strange that I should confess to you. Uh, and yet, um, uh, my name is Suarez, and that comes from the north of Spain. And, and many, many years ago, my forebears, the conquistadores, went into South America. And um, they were good soldiers, but they were not very bright. It runs in the family. And, um, and, and when they saw the indigenous peoples, they saw that they were engaged in terrace farming. And uh, the indigenous peoples were growing at any one time perhaps about a hundred different kinds of potatoes. Some of them were thriving in wet weather and some in dry. Some were resistant to certain kinds of bacteria or fungi. Some were good in sandy soil and others in rich loam. Uh, but by growing a variety of different potatoes, the village was assured that no one would ever starve. And my knucklehead forebears, the conquistadores, saw all these different potatoes and they said, this is really great. We should take, you know, some of this back and, and present them. And they did, and they took two types back. Of, of the about 100 active ones. And in doing that, the seeds of the Irish potato famine were sown. 1.5 million people dead. A million people who had to leave the land and, and the economic degradation of a nation that would not recover for more than a hundred years. This was the price for the lack of foresight of my ancestors who did not understand how woefully terrible monoculture can be. Shift, if you will, for a moment to the greatest collector in human history, a scientist whom you have probably never heard of, and that is something, methinks, of a tragedy. Nikolai Valevov was the director of the, the Great Agrarian and Biological Institute of the Soviet Union, and uh, Valevov is surely the greatest collector in human history. He made a 115 collecting trips to 64 different countries. He learned 15 different languages. And he collected 270,000 different species of plant seeds. And Valdivov believed that he would have the potential to feed the world. You remember from reading your Tolstoy and your Dostoevsky that uh, the Russia, Mother Russia, was um, plagued by great famines, great shortages. And he thought, you know, if I could have the biodiversity of the world in my laboratory, no matter what conditions came up in future, conditions that no man could ever predict, I would have the resources of the whole plant kingdom, the genetic resources, to feed the world. He traded for an additional 100,000 other species, and so he created an institute that had representative seeds from 
170,000 different plants from around the world. How breathtakingly remarkable. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most biodiverse place on earth today. This is the Millennium Seed Bank at Kew in Sussex. And this uh, archive, if you will, this library contains more than 10% of all the known plant species in the world in storage for a modern day version of what Valivov was trying to do to create a bank of biodiversity in the hopes of feeding the world that will be encountering environmental and biohazard problems that we cannot know and cannot anticipate. Huh, very interesting. This is their uh, marker plant, as it were. This is, of course, the pink Yunnan banana, familiar to many of you who have sojourned in China. And the pink uh, Yunnan banana was chosen because of its potential to be a rich food source for much of the world in a variety of conditions to be the the plant that made the 10% mark of their initial goal. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most culturally diverse place in the world. It's the Library of Congress, and it holds 168 million items. It acquires by copyright alone 22 million books a day, uh, 22,000 books a day. How remarkable. So if anybody asks you what the most biodiverse place in the world is, you tell them Q. And strangely, the most culturally diverse place in the world, you tell them Washington, DC. Uh, but in this case, it's true. Or perhaps this is, this would also lay a claim, this is the British Library which might be the most culturally diverse place in the world. A kind of cultural seed bank, perhaps, for the future and present problems of the world. This, ladies and gentlemen, is, in my view, the specialized seed bank for the world. 50 million manuscript pages, 140,000 select manuscripts, many of them of sacred texts, but not only, many of them, as you know, endangered texts. This can be, may be, the future source of human wisdom for millennia. And we should honor this mission deeply it seems to me. For 300 years from now, methinks, men and women will honor the work that you do on behalf of this seed bank. It is true that sometimes uh, destruction, intended destruction, has the opposite effect. If you fire a warehouse of clay tablets, you make them very, very, very hard, and they survive in unprecedented numbers, as, as we know from most of our cuneiform tablets that survive today. But we might usefully think about Himmel and about the Library of Congress and about the British Library as being somewhat equivalent to the strategic grain reserve or the strategic oil reserve. There will be predictable unpredictability. There will be problems that we cannot know. And we must provide for an uncertain future. And that's what we're doing culturally, for we are cultural beings. So I'd, I'd like to just think with you a little bit about this, this famous window from uh, uh, Canterbury Cathedral. Many of you will know it. It's called Adam Delving. 
And I'd just like to review with you the etymology of the word cultivate which of course means to grow a garden, to labor and to dig, to hoe, to plant, but it also means of course to become cultivated oneself. To do the human labor so that we might become more than we are, more than we were before, so that we might bear a kind of human fruit for the common good. And this idea of the constant cultivation that is required of us as citizens of the world is no trivial task. And we need to put the resources to do that at the disposal of the world. So a good example of uh, the loss is not just manuscripts in our world, but also of languages. Um, uh, the death of an old man is a library on fire, right? Because the loss rate of, of languages today is, is vast. Um, by 2115, 90% of them gone. How tragic. You remember the philosophical investigations to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life. These two are sources of cultural diversity, and we need to think about how our libraries are keeping languages alive. Most of us in the room have pretty garbage Syriac, I dare say, but what we're doing in, the, in Himmel, I can't quite get over that acronym, Himmel, um, is, uh, uh, is, is a remarkable thing. But I think it's, it's also true that we need to think about cultural diversity broadly in terms of books, manuscripts, digital materials, linguistic capabilities, the survival and thriving of indigenous peoples, because that kind of diversity is in the interest of the family of humankind, always. Here we see as a signal example uh, one of the flights of steps um, trying to signal this to the general public um, in the Los Angeles County Public Library. Um, so, for instance, an equivalent uh, roughly to your project might be the, the Rosetta project, which is trying to do something like Himmel for the world of vanishing languages. Uh, many of you will recognize this very sadly as uh, the Temple of Baal at Palmyra, um, which is an image that everybody knows now, unfortunately, because of the cultural activity of, of ISIS. Um, I would like to call your attention to the fact that um, the way that that magnificent trading city came into the consciousness of the West was through a book, a book that was in the library of just about every English nobleman. The Ruins of Palmyra in 1753. And the effect of this one book, ladies and gentlemen, was to shift the archaeological focus of many antiquaries in Britain from Greco-Roman archaeology to the Middle East. It fired the imaginations of the virtuosi. And, and so the life of Palmyra and indeed of the Temple of Baal in many ways was mediated to a public through a printed book in this case, one full of rather exquisite engravings. So um, Borges, who, who I'm sad to say, didn't often go to church, um, but, but said that every book was a sacred object. Book here being a, a, a vague marker for any recorded, any transmitted text. So, so here we see um, uh, Pope Benedict venerating uh, a, a sacred text. 
Um, and and that's, that's sort of an obvious example, it seems to me, perhaps, of, of a book as um, a sacred object. But we should also uh, do well, it seems to me, to think about the, the libraries of the world as being very like shrines, temples, churches, places that human beings go to to know who we are. Just as we might go to a place of worship to know who we are because we know more deeply having been to whom we belong. So too in a library, the capacious scholar, the inquiring student might know a little bit more who she or he is by knowing from whence they have come. Uh, which is the book and, and which is the reliquary? They're made to, to look pretty much the same on purpose. Because in medieval Europe, the idea of a book as a kind of human relic was a very active notion. It may seem somewhat perverse for me, a Jesuit, to invoke Milton's Areopagitica, but nonetheless, I shall. You remember Milton says in that treatise on divorce that for books are not altogether dead things, but do contain within themselves a potency of life. The book is on the left. No, the book is on the right. Wait, the book, no, no. Actually, this is the reliquary made to look like a book. This is from Clooney, and, and this is the book. So um, the notion of the library as a ritual space, as a place of pilgrimage, should not be lost altogether upon us. And this might make us think a little bit differently about the mission of libraries and indeed museums as places for fashioning community and identity such that we might deepen our own sense of humanity. The faster the world moves, the more we need to reside in the quiet to know who we are and how we are meant to be in the world. So how do we think about the library as a place of pilgrimage? Um, how do we think about the book as containing that potency of life? Some books are relics. Boniface held it up and um, tried to, to defend himself from the blows of the swords and the axes of the Frisians who were attacking him for his profession of faith. An amazing thing that we still have, this very gospel book that he used as a kind of a shield. But it's also true that thinking about these books as being alive with the judgments of their makers and having much to teach us is worth pausing over, it seems to me. So when we think about the modern rare book library, we might think about something like this. This, of course, is the Beinecke Library at Yale. But more and more, as we think about the contemporary library, we're going to need to think about something like this as well. It's a server farm. And it's both and. It's not either or. But we need to think generously and capaciously about how that both and is going to work. So this is a kind of a library. This is the Microsoft server farm outside of Dublin, Ireland. So 
As we think about the digital domain, and indeed the digital revolution is here and it's here to stay, each one of us has in his or her pocket a computer 20 to 50 times greater than the computer that sent Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon, right? And you didn't pay that much for it. Um, but we also need to think about the limitations of the digital. And sometimes I worry that the digital is, is, is so attractive and has become so necessary in our lives that we, we don't really pay attention to whether the technology is driving us or whether we might be driving the technology. And I think that there are times when we think about the web as being so vast that, that as it were, all of human life is there. But I think there's something that we might think about called Google Goggles that I commend to you. And this is how Google Goggles work. We all use Google, and Google uses a proprietary algorithm, and nobody in this room knows what it is, and nobody in this room can know what it is. And that means that when we all go home tonight and we Google the same thing, we get the same results in the same order. And the World Wide Web, which is deep as the ocean, becomes a mile wide and a millimeter deep because we're all looking at the same results over and over and over again. There's something in information science called confirmation bias. And that is, as we read something and we believe it's true, we begin to only uh, attend to other things that confirm what we already learned. And so by everybody using the same engine with the same algorithm that makes no possibility for information or knowledge, dare I say, having a local habitation and a name, unwittingly, we get a kind of homogenization of human knowledge. When we digitize a copy of a book, Let's say Jonathan Swift's verses on the death of Dr. Swift at the British Library. And then that becomes the copy of the book. Then everybody else says, well, we don't have to spend the time and the money digitizing that because the BL copy must be great. But what that means is that all the, all the people in the world who want to study that poem look at the same copy of the book. But that book is filled with multiple textual variations. The pluriformity of that book is vast. It exists in four different states. I will wager you that the copy that was digitized is not, was not chosen because of its bibliographical integrity. It was chosen because it was the first one in the call number of the copies they had in the BL. So now we have a kind of monoculture again because everybody looks at that copy and says, tick, I've got it. It's on a computer, it must be true, right? And nobody feels the need to look at the other copies. I'm not suggesting digitization is bad and I'm in no way trying to vitiate the work that's being done at this great institution, what I'm trying to say is we need to understand both the affordances and the limitations of the digital domain so that we can use it wisely and well rather than having it be a delimiting tool and leading us unwittingly into a kind of intellectual monoculture that I for one and I hope you find potentially pernicious. So, so I need to ask you a question here. Here is Picasso's great painting, uh, Guernica, right? Uh, on, the, on the tragic bombing in the north of Spain during the Civil War. And um, I, just, I just did a Google image search on this. So which is the real McCoy? What does Guernica look like? And how would you know if you weren't privileged to see it? I remember as a nine-year-old boy in New York being taken by my mother into the museum to see it. And I was terrified by its scale, by its strangeness, much of which is lost here. But how would you know what it really looks like when all of these have a kind of an equal value? So 
just as Newman titled one of his books, we need to think about the world of the library and the world of the web as one of concomitantly both loss and gain. And not just gain, and certainly not just loss. Right? Both. Dare I say to this crowd that a Catholic perspective, that small c, is probably salutary for our avoiding a kind of intellectual monoculture? The other problem with the web, of course, is we don't know how to archive it. And even the problem that we'll all need to solve is the problem of digital curation and preservation over the long term. Digital storage is ubiquitous, but it is notoriously fragile. And the dark archive is no answer to the problem. I've been privileged for the last two years to be a, a presidential fellow of the Council on Library and Information Resources, and that's, that's given me a kind of a license to make inquiry about this problem of uh, digital preservation. And you might think that the NIH would be the place that would have cracked this. Everybody has to deposit their results of when they get NIH grants in the NIH. Huge data sets. So I went and I talked to the NIH. And I can't say who I spoke to or whom I spoke to, but I'll tell you what the person said to me. They said, well, we can't read 80% of the files that are on deposit with us because the programs change, because there's, bes there's bespoke work, because things become corrupt, uh, because there's no such thing that you can't curate that, it's too big. So what does this mean for us in the future? You know, we have a kind of a false security of depositing this, and yet what does it mean if nobody can read it? Huh, data without adequate metadata doesn't exist. So um, Bethany Novisky, who's, who's a, a brilliant scholar in the information age, says, you know, the key to, to the curation of digital information is that it be used and reused and reused. So far from the dark archive being the solution, instead it must be used by students and scholars all the time. And then it will be vital and it will be updated and it will have an ongoing life. How are you doing with those five and a quarter floppies in your attic? Not so great, right? Yeah. So um, the Greek and the Romans taught us that libraries shouldn't be passive storehouses, that, that they should instead be um, active places for the creation of human knowledge. And the future of the preservation of digital information is indeed to maximize access to that data and to help our publics use it for knowledge creation. And that will keep that data fresh and alive. You will notice that I provided as an example the Library of Celsus in Ephesus. Um, that's because I know that some of you visited it a few years ago. Um, so a project I'd like to call to your attention to think about how the world is changing is, is the avian phylogenomics project. And one of the remarkable things about this project is they're trying to, to reconstruct the genome of a whole uh, group of birds, uh, 48, I think, different species of birds, is that they're going into museums and taking what everyone knew was useless, taking what everyone knew should have been thrown away a long time ago. They're harvesting DNA from stuffed birds in dioramas in natural history museums. Stuffed birds that have been in the basements and in metal storage cabinets for a hundred years. Because by gathering and sequencing that DNA, they can collect genetic information that would be otherwise impossible to harvest. And so by preserving the original, 
as technology advances, we find new ways to make use of the past that never could have been envisioned by the people who collected the past in the first place. Many of you will know the project to read the burnt scrolls of Herculaneum. If you don't know it, use that Google thing, um, get an interweb at home, and use that Google thing and just say scrolls, burnt scrolls of Herculaneum. Even if you misspell it, it'll correct it for you. And, and um, those scrolls can't be opened up. They're, they're black, they're fried, they're toast. But by using a kind of tomographic x-ray spectrography, they can cut micro slices through those scrolls and then use a very complex mathematical algorithm to reconstruct it page by page, or at least line by line. And so if you try to unroll the scroll, it turns into dust. But if you leave it intact, then what was destroyed at Herculaneum is now legible for the first time to human beings in centuries because the original has been saved. How remarkable. How remarkable. Um, so too, many of you may know about the, the marvelous work that's being done in kind of archaeological photographic astronomy in which old photographic plates are being used. This one from 1908, of course, it's the Crab Nebula, to learn what the sky looked, looked like more than 100 years ago and to be able to compare these images, say, with contemporary Hubble images and to understand in new ways what's taking place in the galaxy. These useless, useless photographic plate negatives and plate images are now priceless because they can be digitally analyzed, because they can be compared with to new images and, and these different shots, as it were, of the, of the record can now be revealed. And scientists are all over this in a way that nobody could have anticipated in 1908 or in 1980. What do we save? What do we care for? The word to curate comes from the word to care for because one cares so deeply about. So how do we understand the record of human endeavor, of human striving after knowledge, after wisdom? And how do we understand ourselves as having a profound responsibility to future generations? So um, here's an article that you can also uh, get on the web from Atlantic Monthly. I recommend it to you. Um, if a Pulitzer Prize a finalist 34 part series of investigative journalism could disappear from the web, so could anything else. So I, I'd like you, I'm not gonna ask, I'm not gonna call on people, I'm not gonna embarrass anybody, but um, what is the average lifespan of a web page before it, it completely disappears from the web today? And I'm not talking about in Afghanistan, you know, or Ethiopia. Um, I'm talking about in the, in, you know, in, in the civilized West, in America. What's, what's the average life of a web page? It's 100 days. And then it's irrecoverable. So, so what's the speed of the change of this record of human history? And, and, and might this be important for future generations to understand who we are and how we strive to make meaning in the world? Um, you know, uh, in 1997, it was the 900th anniversary of something in England called the Doomsday Book. Domus Daga in Old English, um, the Day of Judgment. And um, the Doomsday Book was a kind of an inventory of lands, of farms, of, of uh, possessions, uh, and a kind of a snapshot of, of the wealth and social uh, uh, disposition of a, of a nation. 
And the BBC decided that to celebrate that 900th anniversary, they would make a, a new doomsday book. And they got school children from all over the UK to contribute, and, and demographers and others. And, and they, put, they put all their data on what they knew was a medium that would last forever. They put it on a laser disc. And within seven years, no machine in the world was able to read the disk. And the University of Leicester and the University of Michigan spent about 100,000 pounds to remediate the data and to build a machine in order to try to be able to recover what had been done. The fragility of the digital domain is with us and we don't know how to deal with it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the doomsday book. And if you know a little Latin and a little Latin paleography, you can read it. It's 900 years old. What's the future of a library? Both and loss, gain care about the tools we use, care about the tools that perhaps in some ways drive our intellectual operations in ways we don't even think about. So what's the changing nature of librarianship? Is a librarian a mouser of old books or is a librarian a teacher? And what might Himmel become in years to come? more and more perhaps a place where men and women come from all over the world to spend time surrounded by the wisdom of history, to spend time with what was deeply imperiled and has been lost, save for the efforts of some men and women who had a vision of their duty to the future. So, Here's Adam delving, Adam laboring, Adam cultivating. The future of digital information is not and never will be, methinks, in stasis, but in constant cultivation, in use and reuse, in enrichment in remediation over and again. I'd like to be very clear that the business of preserving cultural memory is not about the past. The business of preserving cultural memory is about making provision for the future. It's about laboring for the common good in the present. It's about striving in a rapidly changing world to find a place of stillness from which we may understand. In a world of increasing speed and perhaps incomprehensibility, what does the wisdom of multiple cultures have to teach us? And would we acquire that in a soundbite? or through study? Does the true, the good, and the beautiful have anything to do with the quotidian for us? And for whom do we think we're laboring now? So this is the Valovov Scientific Research Institute in St. Petersburg. and. Um, Valovov uh, fell afoul of Papa Joe Stalin and um, died in jail, uh, very sadly. But his, his workers continued to work in, in the Institute and uh, they encountered, of course, uh, the siege of Leningrad. And uh, there were 370 different species of plants and they believed, as did Valovov, that that would be the future to feed the world. And so 
a dozen or 14 of his workers barricaded themselves into the institute in the basement. And gradually, as the siege of Leningrad went on and on and on, unimaginably long, rather than eat the seeds that might have saved their lives, these men and women to a person all, one by one, starved to death. What price they paid for the vision of trying to provide for an imperiled future. We, each one of us, individually and severally, must be a student of the past, not to be some dry bones, dusty antiquary, but rather that we might understand the future and provide for it more generously. My ancestors made a mistake that took the lives of 1.5 million human beings and changed the course of human history. What is the threat of intellectual and cultural and linguistic monoculture in our own time? And how do the efforts that you are undertaking and others like you provide some kind of redress, some kind of hope for the future of human history? Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Suarez. What a wonderful and really profound something we're going to have to think about, and hopefully it was taped so we can listen to this again. Um, Michael's able to take questions for about 10 minutes. I'm sure that this audience has many questions, so uh, I will just stand off to the side and uh, after a, few, a little bit, That's great. call it call it uh, evening and let you have some dessert and uh, some more socialization. But please, some questions for yeah, bother. I'm hungry and yet have to have a drink, so we'll do it 10 minutes and then I'll go get my drink, okay? Is that a deal? Please, questions, comments, excoriations of any kind. Sir. Sure. I, I, did everybody hear the question? Not so much on the preservation of the digital domain, but on its future use. I suppose the first thing I would say, sir, is, you know, if I were good at predicting the future, I'd be a billionaire, right? I would have known what the S&P would be doing today, and, and we all would have been, you know, you wouldn't have to have any fundraisers for, for, for Hillel, right? You know, as for Himmel. So, um, so I'm, I'm not a futurist in any way in that regard. Um, but it seems to me that the, the affordances of the digital are progressing extremely rapidly. A good case in point would be uh, our newfound power using multispectral imaging to analyze documents of many kinds, to understand their, um, a kind of stratigraphy, if you will, of the page. My favorite example of this is work done by Fenella France, the head of the preservation and testing division uh, at the Library of Congress, and I might add a member of the faculty at Rare Book School. And um, Fenella France was looking at uh, Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence. I'm obliged by the Commonwealth of Virginia as an employee to mention Thomas Jefferson at every lecture I give. So, um, but, but, but Fenella of France was looking, using multispectral imaging at a particular moment in the Declaration of Independence in its draft form in which there's a, a smudge that you can't read. And, and by using the affordances of the digital, she discovered 
that what everybody could read as, as citizens, Jefferson had originally referred to us as subjects. And as soon as he wrote it and it was still wet, he smudged it out and wrote over it citizens. And it seems to me that in that moment, the United States of America was born, not subjects, but citizens. And, and it seems to me that our ability to use new things like multispectral imaging, like that kind of um, uh, X-ray tomography with very high-end supercomputing in order to uh, create complex algorithms to read um, millions of data points, perhaps only hundreds of thousands, but I suspect millions, um, to, to, to unroll those fragile Herculaneum scrolls. You know, oh, brave new world that has such creatures in it, right? Um, it seems to me that it's very difficult to anticipate what the affordances of the digital will be 5, 10, 20 years from now. What I know is I want to have a seat at the table. I want to have a seat at the table because it's exciting. It's exciting and inextricably linked to the changing structures of human knowledge. And I might add concomitantly to the changing structures of the academy in which knowledge is created. So we need to be part of it. But at the same time, it seems to me that we also need to have a, a due understanding and um, perhaps even if I dare can use the word in, in this place, reverence for the integrity and the possibility of the ma original material artifact. Uh, because because uh, human beings make culturally transmissible meanings through materiality. And we've learned over time not just to read uh, the linguistic codes of a document, but also to read its material instantiations, which are also redolent of human meaning, meanings, of bibliographical codes and of social codes that help us understand the audience, the price point, the, the, the uh, idea of who the author was, and so on. And I think more and more, this combination of having a widely transmissible digital artifact and safeguarding the original as best we can is going to give the humanities in particular a new kind of puissance, a new power to, to, uh, to do the hermeneutic work of the humanities that, that our, our forebears never had. And, and I actually think that it's in the material turn that we will see a new revitalization of the humanities. Because ultimately, those who study the original artifacts, as I have been privileged to do, are not merely in the business of knowledge. We're in the business of inculcating wonder. And wonder is powerful. Wonder will create the future defenders of the historical record. And, and so I see the direction of the digital as helping us in concert with the close scrutiny of the material instantiation will help us to, to have more knowledge and more wonder. And last time I checked, knowledge and wonder conduce toward love. And that's powerful.